Hey, I'm Roberta Blevins, and this is Life After MLM, a podcast where we work to end the stigma of failure in an industry systemically designed for you to fail. Join us as we dive into the real life stories of survivors, experts, and advocates to debunk the common myths and fallacies of cults, scams, and multi-level marketing. Hey, Hunbots and Hunbros, popping in to do a little bit of housekeeping and to also say, surprise, bonus content. I bet you weren't expecting this. I know I wasn't. <laughs> but what happened was this past weekend, I got really, really, really into The Truth About Pam with Renee Zellweger. I mean, it threw me into a tailspin and I dove down that rabbit hole head first. And while I was down in that burrow, I watched Dateline episodes, episodes of Snapped. I read so many news articles. I looked at maps of St. Louis. I figured stuff out. I Googled like I've never Googled before. And when I hit the bottom, I made this podcast episode because I figured, you know what? Why not? Not every episode has to be about MLM and talking about frauds, scams, cults, and deception all of the little like intricacies that overlap and like make that Venn diagram look more like a circle every day, it's all there. All of those red flags are there. And I think it's important that we're learning about red flags and being able to see it in other scenarios in our lives so that we don't get caught up in that trap. I was absolutely fascinated with the story of Pam Hupp, the way that she just sort of is this... Uh, <laughs> You're about to find out. I don't want to spoil too much if you haven't seen the show. Uh, if you're into true crime, you're going to love it. If you're not into true crime, I'm so sorry. I'll see you on Sunday. It's totally fine. No hard feelings. I will say a little content warning. There are two actual 911 calls in this episode. So here's your content warning. If that's triggering, um, you'll know exactly when they show up and you'll be able to just skip ahead. Um, it is not the full call. I did edit it down. The full original full call was like 10 minutes long and I just, I didn't want to, it was hard for me to listen to and I didn't want to put you guys through that either. So I edited it down to really just sort of preserve the, the vibe, the feel and, and sort of like the evidence and what was stated in that call, because it's also very important. And that call becomes so important to this case that I couldn't leave it out. And then the second call, um, again, another heads up and warning, but you do actually hear gunshots that end someone's life in that call. So again, can be very triggering. And I just want to give you guys that heads up as well. The deception and fraud of this woman is the audacity for real. And if you're into this sort of stuff, let me know. There are all these other documentaries that I want to watch and sort of debunk and do this stuff too. I like doing it on YouTube, but I like doing this too because it's sort of like my own thing and I can just sort of do it in the little buckets of my day. Anyway, not to get all hun butt on you, but I'm really excited about this podcast. So I'm going to end it here and let me give you all the ugly truth about Pam Hupp. On December 27th, 2011, at approximately 9.40 p.m., a 911 call came in from the Faria residence in Troy, Missouri. Lincoln County 911, what is the location of your emergency? Okay, ma'am. Hello? Yes, I need you to take a couple deep breaths so I can see what's going on. Okay, who am I speaking with? My name is Russell Faria. Russell, what's going on there? I just got home from a friend's house. And, and my wife, my wife killed herself. She, she, she's on the floor. Okay, Russell, I need you to calm down, honey, okay? I need you to calm down, take a couple deep breaths. We're going to get somebody on the way there, okay? <laughs> what What did she do? Do you know? She got a knife in her neck and she spread her arms. Is she breathing at all? No. She is not breathing? No, there's one like come up. I'm okay. How old is your wife? My wife, she's, she's, she's 42. 42? Okay, and you're for sure she's not breathing right now? No, she's not even dead. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay, they're on the way, honey. They're just calm down for me, okay? <laughs> Russell, how long were you gone today? I, I, I left around five. And I just got back. But she was at her mom's and her friend was bringing her home, so I don't know, know what time she got home. 
Has she been depressed lately? <laughs> she's got, she's got, she's, she's got cancer. She is, but she does have cancer. Yeah. I don't know what where, to where, do. Russell, where's the knife now? It's, it's, it's I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said, hon. It's laying right next to her. It's in her neck. It's in her neck. Okay. <laughs> Oh, my God. I wish you do this to me. I wish you do Russell, they're on the way, hon, okay? They'll be there shortly. <laughs> Is there anybody else there in the house with you? No, no. There's nobody else here. I don't know what I do. Is she on any, was she on any medication? Is she on any medication for chemotherapy? Okay, can you do me a favor? What I need you to do is I need to get those I need you to get those medications for the paramedics, okay? Uh, I think they're here on the table. Yeah, we have we have everybody coming to you, okay? <laughs> no. No. Okay, where is she in the house? She's 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 right in the room. In the living room? <laughs> okay. Where are you right now? <laughs> okay. Russell, take a couple deep breaths. Okay, I don't need you hyperventilating, okay? Oh, my God. What am I going to do? Oh, my God. What is her name? <laughs> her name is Betsy. Betsy? Yes. <laughs> Betsy. <laughs> she was at her mom's house. At her house. mom's house and her friend dropped her. And her friend was going to bring her home from her mom's house. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Russell, she, do you think that she's beyond help right now? I think she is dead. Okay. Oh, my God. She's gone. Oh my god, no. Oh my god. You have dogs outside? My my dog, my dog. She's on the chain. Okay. She's in the backyard. Okay. She's <laughs> oh. Russell, I have a couple officers that are out there right now. Can you do me a favor and open your front door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you go meet them at the door? It's all right. Russell, are the officers inside with you now? Oh, my God. Yeah, this is, this is right here. Okay, well, good luck to you, honey. I'm going to go ahead and hang up, and we're going to try to call your mom, okay? okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. 42-year-old Betsy Faria was dead. Her body already cold and stiff. Her wrists had been cut, and there was a knife sticking out of her neck. She had been stabbed 55 times. Betsy was the kind of person that everybody loved. She was full of life, gregarious, and a good friend. She was a mother of two girls, Leah and Mariah Day, and a wife to Russ for 11 years. He was a loving and caring husband and stepfather. They met when Betsy was picking up shifts at a local gas station while running her own DJ business that she had started at 18 called Party Starters. They were married in 2000. Betsy had also previously worked in insurance at State Farm. It was at State Farm that she would first meet Pamela Hupp. In fact, Betsy trained Pam and taught her everything she knew about the insurance business. In January 2010, Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer and reconnected with her former coworker. Pam started helping Betsy and would take her to chemo treatments. It looked like Betsy had beaten the cancer and was planning a celebration vacation for winter 2011, but the cancer unfortunately came back, spread to her liver, and was terminal. Around noon on the day of the murder, Russ texted Betsy to let her know he would pick her up from her mother's house after his game night with friends. She had been staying there after a chemo treatment that afternoon. Betsy agreed, but later texted back saying that Pam would take her home instead. At 7.05, when Pam drops off Betsy, they call Pam's husband Mark, but he doesn't answer, and Betsy leaves him a holiday greeting on his voicemail. Russ worked from home that day until around 5 p.m., He left the house to run some errands and to go to his weekly Tuesday night game night. He got gas, cigarettes, dog food, and two Snapples. 
He got to his friend's house around six. They were going to play Rollmaster, a role-playing card game that's sort of similar to Dungeons and Dragons, but different, and I don't know why or how. But they didn't have enough players, so they watched movies instead. He left his friend's house around 9 p.m. and swung by Arby's on his way home for some junior cheddar melts. He arrives home at 9.40, drops the dog food on the ground, finds Betsy, and calls 911. That call will become the basis for many opinions and speculative theories. First was the mention of suicide. Perhaps Russ assumed suicide because the previous conversations and attempts that Betsy had had in her past. I would think that a murderer wouldn't intentionally lie about knowing it was a murder and would have said something like, she's been stabbed on the 911 call instead, because anybody who examined the body could tell it wasn't a suicide, maybe made to look partially like one, but the grisly scene looked more like an intense crime of passion than a suicide. The body had coagulated and dried blood, and the fire captain and EMS supervisor on the scene both concluded that Betsy had died more than an hour earlier. The autopsy revealed that her wrists weren't just slashed. The knife had been driven all the way to the bone. It had sliced into her skull, plunged into her left eye, and lacerated her throat, bursting the right carotid artery. There were deep punctures in her abdomen, perforations in her lungs, liver, and spleen. The 55 stab wounds were mostly post-mortem, methodically placed to make it appear as if it was a domestic crime of passion. An initial search of the house turns up a pair of Russ's slippers that have large spots of blood on the tops and sides in his closet, and a bloody smear on a light switch with a fabric impression. Cops believe there is evidence of blood cleanup in the kitchen and take photos of the crime scene. At the police station, Russ is interrogated and held for 24 hours. He never asks for a lawyer and maintains his story and innocence the entire time, despite intense interrogation and questioning. Some of the suspicious behavior being shown by Russ included being visibly upset but having limited tears. His surges of emotions were too over the top. He hadn't embraced his wife's dead body. He was sobbing and praying in the interview room, among other ridiculous speculations. They scrutinized his alibi, believing it to be too solid, and that all of his errands were just him establishing a timeline. They schedule a polygraph for the next day, and Russ fails it. The police interview friends of Betsy, and Pam confesses that she knows very intimate details about the Faria marriage because she's Betsy's best friend. She claims that Russ is physically and verbally abusive, an alcoholic, and that Betsy was afraid of him. She told officers she felt bad for leaving Betsy there alone that night to deal with her husband's violent temper when he got home. Pam is being very helpful and cooperative with the police giving DNA and fingerprints, and even remembering a silver Nissan Maxima that had been in the driveway when she dropped Betsy off the night of the murder. She claimed Betsy didn't have her keys because Russ had told her not to bring them. First, she claimed she didn't go inside. Then she did, but only to turn on a light. And then it was to just go to look at a Christmas present that Betsy had received. When she left, she said Betsy was tucked in blankets on the couch, but then later said that she may have still been on the couch, but today it makes sense that she walked me to the door. She told the police that she called Betsy at 727 to tell her she was home and then corrected herself by saying almost home. Cell phone records show she was still within three miles of Betsy's house at that time. When she got home, she called her son, texted Betsy to no reply, called Betsy's mom and said she was worried that Betsy was mad at her for not staying longer. And then she claimed she was worried about Betsy's mental state. And Betsy's mom also tried calling to no answer. The next day, they come back to interview Pam's husband, Mark Hupp, and for some reason allow Pam to be present during the questioning. After Mark confirms his whereabouts on the night in question, Pam takes over. She tells investigators Russ likes to brag about the money he will get when Betsy dies, and that he plays a game where he covers her face with a pillow and tells Betsy, this is what it feels like to die, and that there is an email about this that they need to look for. On January 4th, 2012, Russ is arrested and indicted for first-degree murder. His bail is set at $250,000, which he could not afford. His cousin reaches out to a lawyer she knew when she was a legal secretary named Joel Schwartz, and he takes the case. Reading through the police reports, Joel can't help but ask why the police aren't looking deeper into Pam Hupp. She had been the last person to see Betsy alive. Four days before the murder, she had become the sole beneficiary to a $150,000 life insurance policy, and her story kept changing. Russ, on the other hand, had a solid alibi with four witnesses testifying that they were with him at the time of the murder, 
receipts for every stop and purchase with timestamps, as well as local surveillance cameras to confirm everything. Based on evidence, cops tried to recreate Russ's drive home to see if it was even possible at all. With speeding, driving on the shoulder, and not making any stops, they clocked the route at 23 minutes. That gave Russ only nine minutes to stab his wife 55 times, attempt to clean up the scene, and call 911. There was no blood evidence found on Russ's clothes or body, and he was still wearing the same outfit he had been seen in on camera earlier that day. The police scrutinized every aspect of Russ's route that day. Why did he stop at multiple gas stations and stores? Well, like most of us, Russ had a routine and preferences for where he liked to make purchases. The gas station he went to sold his cigarettes for cheaper, and he had a rewards card for the pet food. But what about the slippers, the ones that seemed to be dipped in blood and planted? There were no bloody footprints at the scene, no blood spatter on the tops of the slippers, and no evidence that they were worn at all. When Joel rereads Pam's statements, the words are loaded. She claims Russ told Betsy not to bring her purse or belongings with her, and that his car was allegedly in the driveway, that the house was dark, and that the front door was unlocked. But when Russ was asked about this, he had a perfectly good explanation. I never told her not to take her purse. What it was, we'd been gone all weekend. We went to my parents for Christmas and her sisters for Christmas with her dad. Russ drove and Betsy didn't bring her purse. So when Betsy decided to spend Monday night at her mom's house and needed to go home Tuesday, she called Russ to remind him that she didn't have her keys and he said he would leave the door unlocked for her. In fact, a friend reported that Betsy had called her that day around five to chat and Betsy had said, oh crap. I left my keys at home. I'm going to have to call Russ and have him leave the door open. But what about that failed polygraph? Well, here are some quick facts. Russ had been awake for 32 hours when he was given the polygraph, and he had been under the influence of marijuana. Russ was unsure if it was a real or a faux polygraph, only that someone with a laptop had asked him questions. And faux polygraphs are a thing. They just have to be disclosed, and there was no notice of that. Joel asked for the video and the audio of the polygraph and was told that the camera wasn't working. He asked for the raw data and he never received it. The only documentation found was a consent form and a type summary that said there were significant, consistent physiological responses indicative of deception. Russ and all four alibi witnesses volunteered to take polygraphs and the prosecutor declined. As Joel analyzed the accounts, reports, and evidence, he noticed many more inconsistencies with Pam's stories. The car in the driveway had changed from a silver sedan to a blue SUV. Pam said she didn't go inside and then later said she was in the bedroom, so Joel concluded that she went everywhere there was potential evidence to be found. Pam was swabbed for DNA, but there was no record of any of it being compared against the case evidence. No one confirmed what Pam was wearing that night, and no one tested her or her car for blood evidence. When asked about Betsy and Pam's friendship, Russ said, the last six months to a year, they started hanging out. It just kind of gradually, once she was diagnosed with cancer, a lot of people wanted to be with her. I never had a problem with Pam personally. She was easy to talk to, but I could name half a dozen other people that Betsy was closer to. The Friday before the murder, Betsy signed a change of beneficiary form and Pam took her to the post office. Later, she said she didn't remember if Betsy had mailed it, but on January 17th, told State Farm that they did in fact go to the post office because she wanted to make sure it was postmarked. State Farm called Detective Sergeant Ryan McCarrick, and he assured them that Pam Hupp was not a suspect, and they cut her a check. In all of her interviews with detectives, Pam is cool, calm, and collected. She answers their questions with ease and offers more details than asked. She asks if it's normal for families to turn on people when money is involved, claiming her feelings are hurt and she didn't put a gun to Betsy's head to make the change. When asked to take a polygraph herself, Pam was at first very cooperative and agreed. She then hired a lawyer who delayed it, claimed she had a traumatic brain injury, so the police asked her to obtain a doctor's clearance. And here's what Pam asked for. Dear Dr. Fisher, could you please write Detective Kaiser a letter stating that I was not able to do a polygraph due to medical reasons? Don't need any more details than that. And Dr. Fisher responds, Pamela Hopp is unable to undergo a polygraph due to her medical condition. But in a deposition, he said, she said that she didn't think she could do it. 
Apparently, the police thought she couldn't do it. I would say there's not any condition that would prevent her from doing it. Joel asks, there is nothing about her condition that would actually keep her from telling the truth? And Dr. Fisher responds, as far as I'm aware, there's not anything that would limit her. In her deposition, Pam denied writing the note at all, saying, I don't think I said anything. Joel asked, well, if you did, it certainly wouldn't have said, write something saying I can't take a polygraph due to medical reasons. And Pam responded, absolutely not. When Joel deposed Detective McCarrick, he said, based on training and experience of dealing with hundreds of interviews with suspects and with witnesses and with victims, I did not see any signs of deception that would lead me to believe that she was indicating anything that was untrue to me. Yet, she never disclosed that she had previously been fired from two insurance jobs for forging signatures, never gave any medical records to support her traumatic brain injury claim, and the department never even asked for them. When deposed by Joel, Pam claimed to not know what her disability was, only that she had tripped at work and had hit her head on a filing cabinet in November of 2009. Pam claimed numerous injuries, including traumatic brain injuries and chronic pain in her back, neck, and legs, rendering her unable to work. She collected disability checks monthly, and when asked in his deposition, her husband was unaware of her injuries or how they happened. She knew she had an injury, but not what kind, and only knew she had memory issues because she couldn't remember things. She then admitted to not having health or life insurance, saying that she didn't believe in it for herself, adding that her husband has a policy, and amazingly, he's still alive because it's a lot, adding, I mean, I guess if I wanted a lot of money, I could kill him instead of her. And Joel asks, instead of who? And Pam responds, Betsy. Joel then asks, who said you killed Betsy? And Pam replies, you did, or your private detectives told my friends that. And Joel asks, and you didn't kill Betsy? And Pam responds, I did not kill Betsy. And Joel asks, you still willing to take that polygraph? And Pam says, no. The trial begins November 18th, 2013, and we meet Leah Askey, the Lincoln County prosecutor who claims Russ killed Betsy, motivated by greed, using examples from witnesses that Russ smoked pot, cussed a lot, had a nasty temper, was crude, had a lot of debt, and still believed he was the beneficiary of the insurance policy. His stepdaughters testified against him. Lots of speculation, but where is the evidence? A blue star forensics test, similar to luminol, is ordered for the presence of blood on the scene. There was a splotch that looked like it could have maybe been a bloody paw print, but crime scene investigators testified that it couldn't be determined. They also testified that there were no bloody footprints in the home and nothing that matched Russ's slippers. Police officers testified the Blue Star testing had revealed a glowing trail of blood evidence, but also that their camera had malfunctioned and the photos were useless. Lab tests could not confirm that there was blood on the kitchen floor, the towel drawer, or in the drain pipes. Joel was convinced that Betsy had died before 7.21 p.m. Several calls from her daughter that Betsy was expecting went unanswered at 7.21, 7.26, and 7.30. Evidence of rigor mortis in the body also confirmed the time of death as such. Lincoln County investigators never mapped Russ or Pam's cell phone use the night of the murder, but Joel stepped in and brought in an expert. Russ's phone didn't reach his home quadrant until 9.37. At 9.40... He called 911. Joel wasn't allowed to talk about Pam's phone or to bring up the possible motive and life insurance change because the prosecutor had argued that Pam had no involvement. When cross-examining her inconsistencies, Joel was told that he was impeaching the witness. The prosecution didn't understand why Joel was trying to point fingers at Pam. His questions were answered with, I have a little bit of a memory problem. I'm 55 and going through menopause. Joel was able to make an offer of proof, meaning that he could question Pam without the jury present, but also on the record, about the insurance money. On the suggestion of the prosecution, Pam had placed $100,000 of the payout in a trust for Betsy's daughters. When asked about the remaining $50,000, she said, My other girlfriend died of breast cancer in August, and she has a 12-year-old daughter that I'm trying to help. But that was a lie. She later admitted to lying to anyone who would bug her and bug her and bug her and bug her about the payout. The entire trial is a mess of poor effort, 
loose theories, inconclusive and circumstantial evidence, but Leah Askey's theory takes the cake. She claims that Russ had planned this for months, if not years, as the ultimate role play game. Every single stop in his day was just a way to create a solid alibi. But in Askey's story, Russ drops his phone off at his buddies before returning home to have sex with Betsy before murdering her while naked because there's no blood spatter evidence on his clothes. He then showers, puts the dog out, and calls 911. While cleaning up, he tosses his bloody slippers into the closet and his buddy swings by with an Arby's receipt and his phone. And all of his friends were in on it and testified to it. So the Lincoln County prosecutor accuses four more innocent people of murder without any evidence at all. Four and a half hours later, the jury returns a guilty verdict. Later on, jurors would admit to thinking that they were just trying to pin this on Pam Hupp and that Russ's alibi was too tight and that his friend's stories were too similar. Russ is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But this is where the story gets started because this is a story about fraud. So let's talk about that trust, shall we? Four days before Betsy is murdered, on December 23rd, 2011, Pam Hupp becomes the sole beneficiary to a $150,000 life insurance policy, which was allegedly supposed to be for Betsy's two daughters, Leah and Mariah. In June 2012, Detective Sergeant McCarrick interviews Pam, and she tells him during this interview that Betsy wanted Pam to be the beneficiary in order to get the money to Faria's daughters. He tells Pam that setting up a trust before the trial would be beneficial to the case. And Pam explains that Betsy Faria changed her life insurance policies multiple times, depending on who she was angry with at the time. She claims that Russ did not have a lot of discretionary money and had recently applied for food stamps. A year later, in June 2013, Pam sets up the trust. She funds the trust five months after that, right before the trial starts. On October 31st, 2013, Pam's mom dies mysteriously, but more on that later. During the criminal trial in November 2013, Assistant Attorney General Richard Hicks asked if Betsy's purpose was to try to assure that the money got to her daughters, and Pam testified that that was correct. Then she described putting $100,000 in the trust fund for the girls and giving the remaining fifty dollars to a family in need, which we know is a lie. She also claimed part of the missing trust money went to her mother's funeral expenses. In December 2013, Pam withdraws $99,700 from the trust. In early 2014, Pam claims that all the days had to do to get their money was to contact her. But when they asked, Pam told them no. In July 2014, Pam revokes the trust entirely because the days said hurtful things about her in their depositions. On April 17th, 2014, the Day sisters sue Pamela and Mark Hupp for the proceeds of their mother's $150,000 state farm life insurance policy, alleging constructive fraud and unjust enrichment. In July 2014, the civil trial begins, and Pam testifies about the trust. Police were asking me to do it. I should do it. It would help their case. Detective McCarrick told me, you can do what you want with it. It's yours, but... We would like for you to set up a trust for the girls. It's a revocable trust, so I revoked it. I revoked the funds. It was my money. In a deposition on July 21st, 2014, Pam denied ever saying that the money was supposed to go to the daughters. Pam was financially driven, but cheap. She claimed that she was debt-free and that $150,000 was not that much in her world. When a lawyer asked her about the sudden $135,000 deposited into her bank account, she said, I could receive it from anywhere. I could receive it from my brother. I could receive it from my mother. I could receive it from, what do you think? I'm poor. I don't know people. I don't know what you're insinuating. Pam somehow won the civil case and used the insurance money to buy and flip a house that they sold for $250,000 a year later in 2015. And remember that mysterious death I mentioned earlier? Well, toward the end of the murder trial in 2013, Joel asked Pam why it took her so long to set up the trust, and she said that she had been busy dealing with the sudden death of her mother from Alzheimer's, and Joel didn't think twice. But Pam's mom, Shirley Newman, didn't die from Alzheimer's. She died from blunt force trauma to the chest after falling off her third floor balcony while having eight times the limit of Ambien in her system. 
At 5 p.m. on October 30th, 2013, Pam dropped her mother off at her assisted senior living facility where she lived alone. Shirley was 77 years old and suffered from dementia and arthritis. Pam set her mother up for the night and came down to tell the staff that Shirley would not be down for dinner and to not expect her for breakfast either. Shirley was found the next day on Halloween at 2.30 p.m. underneath her third floor balcony. The railing had broken. A retired homicide detective said that the railing looked like it had been kicked out and tests to replicate the accident were inconclusive. Dateline NBC asked a structural engineer to examine the balcony posts and he said this, it would take a lawnmower or a vehicle to cause that much bending. A 210 pound woman, even if she fell headlong into the balusters, would only exert 420 pounds of force, nowhere near enough to do that type of structural damage. The death is ruled an accident. But Pam was the last person to see her mother alive, and not surprisingly, she was awarded $120,000 in her mother's estate settlement, as well as $10,000 in a life insurance payout. After Pam was interviewed about her mother's death, an anonymous letter was sent to the news reporter who broke the story. Dear sirs, I think it's getting a little silly that you keep accusing someone of killing their parent when it's not true. But all Joel could think about was when Pam had made a strange remark in the murder trial. If I really, I hate to say it, wanted the money, my mom's worth half a million that I get when she dies. If I really wanted money, there was an easier way. This new testimony in the civil case over the trust brings up new evidence in the Rusferia murder case. Joel files what is called a Mooney motion, which through a writ of habeas corpus, it is established that a conviction based upon false evidence violates due process, meaning that people have rights and they essentially can't be violated this way. On February 24th, hey, that's my birthday, 2015, Russ's murder case was remanded and he is awarded a new trial in June of 2015. In the first murder case, officers testified that the Blue Star testing photos had malfunctioned and could not be used as evidence. But in the summer of 2015, Joel received a CD with 132 crime scene photos. Some were dark, some had slight luminescence, but most photos showed nothing at all. It wasn't that the camera had malfunctioned. It was that the photos didn't show what they wanted them to. He also received an anonymous email that looked a lot like a love letter from Mike Lang, the captain of investigation, to Leah Askey, the Lincoln County prosecutor. They both denied the affair, but Joel also remembers asking Mike Lang for cell phone data that he never bothered to request. What happens next is something no one expected. A videotaped interview of Pam confessing a secret. She had been more than just Betsy's best friend. She was also her secret lover. And while neither Betsy nor Pam were lesbians, trauma had given Betsy an insatiable sexual appetite. So Pam, being the most supportive friend in the world, replaced what a husband would be. And the detective interviewing her eats it up, adding, well, that's the problem solver in you. You knew what would help her. But a longtime acquaintance of Pam said, Pam was the most homophobic person I had ever met. And she would say, that's not normal. That's not right. In the beginning of the investigation, Pam had told detectives that she barely knew Russ at all. But with her new lesbian love affair plot line, she had new information. She now claimed a month before the murder, Russ had come home and found them together. Pam claimed he pushed her up against the wall, and she mentions remembering the spit flying from his mouth as he told her, If you ever come over here again, it'll be the last time. If you two fucking muff bumpers, if I ever catch you guys again, I'm going to bury you in the backyard. Four months later, in October, Pam remembered another detail about the night of the murder. She remembers seeing Russ at the crime scene, even though three years prior she had testified that she hadn't. She blames head trauma and Ambien for her memory loss, but explains to the detectives the more that she talks about it, the clearer it gets. But during the civil trial, when she was asked if she had any memory problems, she testified no. People like Pam make the best liars. When caught in a lie, she deflects brazenly. She isn't afraid and often uses contradiction to her advantage claiming she doesn't remember or filling in details with blah, blah, blah. She skips over important events and overly describes basic ones. Two weeks before the trial, a forensic computer expert finds the pillow email that Pam had talked so much about. Joel has his own expert analyze the data and discovers a few things. One, it was the only document on the laptop with the author listed as unknown. A 
fragment of the same text was associated with Microsoft Word 97 software, which was not on Betsy's laptop. Her laptop had been connected to a Wi-Fi network called The Club the day Pam watched Betsy play tennis. The Microsoft Outlook email application had been opened at the same time, but because Betsy didn't use Outlook, it wasn't configured and the document couldn't be emailed. Cookies showed a search for Betsy's signature block on the laptop. The email read, I know we talked about this yesterday, but I feel I really need you to believe me. I really do feel that Russ is going to do something to me. He continued to tell me how much money he would make after I die. Last night was the worst. I fell asleep on the couch while watching TV and I woke up to Russ holding a pillow over my face. He said that he wanted me to know what dying feels like. I need to change my life insurance. Do you think I could put it in your name and you could help my daughters when they need it? If something happens to me, would you please show this to the police? This email right here contradicts her testimony that she believed that the money was never for the daughters. It's just it's insane. Anyway, Pam is deemed not a credible witness, obviously, and is never called to take the stand. Experts testified that the slippers looked to be dipped in blood and planted, and the judge deliberated for two hours, pronounced the Lincoln County investigation rather disturbing, and read his verdict. Acquitted. In June 2015, Russ Faria is a free man. With ASCII unwilling to look at Pam as a suspect, the case goes cold. A year later, on August 16th, 2016, a 911 call is placed at the Hupps residence. 911, what's your emergency? Hey, hello, there's someone broken in my house. Help! Where's the address you're at? Get out! Well, then, can you do what we did to your wife? No, I'm not getting in the car with you. No, get away. Get out! Get out! Get out! Pam claimed there had been an intruder and she had shot him to death in self-defense. In his pocket, police find a pen, $900 in sequential $100 bills, and a note instructing him to get Russ's money. Pam claimed she had just come back from running errands when a silver colored sedan pulled up and a strange man jumped out and got into her car. He demanded Russ's money and told her he was going to kill her. Pam claimed that he had a knife and she knocked it out of his hands with a karate chop. She claimed she was then chased into her home and into her bedroom where she grabbed a Ruger LCR revolver and emptied its chamber into Louis Gumpenberger, a 33-year-old father of two. But Louis Gumpenberger was a soft-spoken and childlike mama's boy after a drunken car crash had left him with severe head trauma. He walked with a limp, his left arm hung useless, and he couldn't process complex thoughts. He lived with his mother and never left home except to take walks in his St. Charles neighborhood, a historic district on the Missouri River. As if this story couldn't get any crazier, six days earlier, a woman named Carol Alford had called 911 to report a strange experience. She had been approached by a blonde woman claiming to be a producer with Dateline named Kathy, offering $1,000 to reenact a 911 call for the show. Carol agreed, and while en route, felt uneasy and asked to be taken home. Her security camera perfectly picked up Pam Hupp in her 2016 gray GMC Acadia license plate at all. It was at this point in my research that I discovered that Pam Hupp and I drive the exact same car. Or, I guess, drove. <laughs> Not anymore. But mine isn't gray. It's iridium metallic. Anyway. On August 23rd, local law enforcement announced their theory. Cell phone records showed Pam had been in Lewis's neighborhood 45 minutes before her 911 call was placed. They believe that Pam pretended to be a Dateline producer and had lured Lewis into her car, offering him money for his help reenacting a 911 call for the show. And then she shot him to once again frame Russ for Rhea and shift the implication of murder from herself. The $900 in sequential bills that had been found in Lewis's pocket matched bills in Pam's nightstand. 
a note in Lewis's pocket instructed him to kill Pam after he had gone with her to the bank to get Russ's money and drop it off in a wood pile in Russ's yard. That single fact about a wood pile was odd, but then Russ remembered that his dad had left a pile of wood in the yard. So a neighbor checked their security cameras and they caught a GMC Acadia speeding through the neighborhood several days earlier with an I Heart Dog sticker on the window. On August 23rd, 2016, Pam is arrested and taken into custody. While cooperating with police in the interview room, Pam asks for a lawyer. The officer leaves the room to handle the request and Pam palms a ballpoint pen that was left on the table and asks to use the restroom. While in the restroom, Pam stabs herself in the neck and wrists with the pin in what has been called a consciousness of guilt. Pam is stabilized and bail is set for $2 million. On December 16th, 2016, Pam is indicted. On January 31st, 2017, she pleads not guilty to the murder of Louis Gumpenberger. In March 2017, they seek the death penalty. In November of 2017, the chief medical examiner changes the manner of death in the Shirley Newman case from accidental to undetermined. In August of 2018, the trial is set for June of 2019. Two years after the murder of Louis Gumpenberger, Pam Hupp enters an Alford plea. An Alford plea is a guilty plea in which a defendant maintains their innocence and does not admit to the criminal act they are accused of but admits that the prosecution has sufficient evidence to persuade a judge or jury to find the defendant guilty and thus agrees to be treated as guilty. It's basically taking the easy way out. The knife found in Pam's car that she karate chopped out of Lewis's hand was from the Dollar Tree, as well as the paper the note in Lewis's pocket was written on, along with other items in Pam's house that matched her receipt from earlier. The knife in the car was wedged similarly to how Pam stored her knives in her kitchen. A large carpet swatch had been laid down to protect the floor from blood. And lastly, Lewis had mental and physical disabilities that would have prevented him from running after Pam, brandishing a weapon, and completing the attack as described. Defendants usually entered an Alfred guilty plea if they want to avoid a possible worse sentence were they to lose the case against them at trial. It affords defendants the ability to accept a plea bargain while maintaining innocence. So Pam never admits to the murder and she can't be given the death penalty either. Like I said, the easy way out. And Pam tells her family it's to spare them of having to witness an ugly trial. On August 12, 2019, Pam is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Louis Gumpenberger. In late 2019, after local elections, the Betsy Faria case is reopened. COVID slows the investigation, but on July 8th, 2021, Pam is officially interviewed about her involvement in the case for the first time. Eight years later. Four days later, on July 12th, 2001, Pam Hopp is charged with the first degree murder of Betsy Faria. The case states that Pam murdered Betsy for financial gain that she was repeatedly stabbed while sleeping and weakened from her chemo treatments earlier that day, and that Pam had used her socks as makeshift gloves to plant blood evidence to frame Russ before placing them back on her feet, which explains that fabric impression on the light switch. She was named the sole beneficiary of a $150,000 policy four days before the murder, but she never even attempted to ever give any of the money to Betsy's daughters, despite Betsy's dying wishes. Pam had insisted on driving Betsy home, even though it was out of her way, she was unfamiliar with the area, and had night blindness when driving. The position of Betsy's body indicated that she had been attacked by someone she trusted. Pam had texted Betsy home at 720, despite cell phone records placing her still within the vicinity at that time. And then there was the prosecutorial misconduct by the Lincoln County Law Enforcement Agencies, confirmation bias to protect their own civil liberties rather than getting justice for the victims. And on November 15th, a destruction of evidence request was put in for the Faria trial. Chris Kunza Minimeyer, the judge in Russ's first trial, has had four cases reversed by the appeals court and was suspended without pay. Betsy's daughters, Leah and Mariah, are appealing the civil court judge's decision to allow Pam to keep the insurance money. 
In July 2001, Pam pleads not guilty to the murder of Betsy Faria. A preliminary trial was set for February of this year, but had to be postponed because Pam's public defender died of a heart attack. In October 2019, Gumpenberger's mother, Margaret Birch, filed a lawsuit for wrongful death, fraud, and misrepresentation against Pam. In July 2020, Birch was awarded a judgment of $3 million. Birch's attorney, Gary Berger, subsequently filed to garnish Hupp's prison trust account, into which her $1,200 COVID-19 CARES Act relief stimulus was paid. As of February 2022, the family has not received any significant money. In September 2020, Pam's husband, Mark Hupp, filed for divorce, describing their marriage as irretrievably broken. In September 2020, Hupp filed a motion to vacate her conviction. In the legal context, a motion to vacate is a formal request to overturn a court's earlier judgment, order, or sentence. Pam claimed she was pressured to take a plea, and it was denied the following March as untimely. No one disputed that Pam Hupp was out of time to file her motion to vacate and get out of prison. Pam claimed that the coronavirus had kept her from filing on time. There have been six episodes of Dateline about the murder of Betsy Faria. The only other cases to receive more attention were O.J. Simpson and Jean Benet Ramsey. St. Louis's Fox 2's Chris Hayes had covered the story for over 10 years, generating more than 60 stories on the case. And in May 2020, NBC announced that they were going to be making a six-episode miniseries called The Truth About Pam. It aired in March 2022, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. A book about the murder of Betsy Faria by Joel Schwartz and Charles Bosworth Jr., Bone Deep, Untangling the Betsy Faria Murder Case, was published in 2022. And that's where we're at. So, yeah. About a week ago, I watched The the Truth About Pam with Renee Zellweger, um, and I was fascinated. I don't really report on true crime, right? Like, I've talked about MLM true crimes and things like that, but I don't really report on true crime, but... This case was just so full of fraud and lies and people just ignoring evidence and ignoring truth for their own confirmation bias. And it's just, it's in that space. And I just, I felt so compelled to learn more about this case. And then the more that I learned, the more articles that I read, the more datelines that I watched, the more things that I found. And to me, it was just, such a wild case of just believing somebody so blindly without actually having any facts. And to me, that's incredibly dangerous. Um, And so I wanted to share it because one, I want to create bonus content and this is something that I'm very interested in. And two, it's fraud. And the Venn diagram is really close to being a circle. There's so many similarities between this and cults and MLMs and other frauds and scams that we've seen. And so you know, reporting on it and, and talking about those similarities, I think for me is, is something that I'm really passionate about. And um, I like to push that education forward. So if this is something you guys like, let me know. I will do more bonus content like this on Wednesdays. Uh, Sundays are still reserved for survivors, but let's do some bonus content. So if there's any stories that you guys are like, oh my gosh, you have got to listen to this fraud case. You've got to check this out. Let me know. Hit me up. Email me. I would love to to do a bonus podcast episode on a story that you sent me. I would absolutely love it. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you Sunday. Thank you so much for listening to Life After MLM. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And follow us on social media at Life After MLM Podcast and my advocacy at The Real Roberta Blevins. You can find all of the links to the social accounts in our show notes. And if you just listened to that incredible story and you thought, oh my God, I have a story just like that that needs to be told, hit me up, therealrobertablevins at gmail.com. I would love to have you on the show to share your story and start your journey in life after MLM. See you next time, Hans. <laughs>